Mm. Hey everyone, today I'll present an introduction to geometric algebra. Uh, it's a mathematical framework. If you don't know about it yet, uh, yeah, you'll find out more about it now. Uh, so yeah, why would you want to learn geometric algebra? Um, one thing is it unifies many different fields of physics and uh, it's kind of a natural language for them. So it's one example I have here is these are the four Maxwell equations in the usual form with vectors. And uh, you can see there, uh, we have the E and B fields, and we have uh, different kinds of derivatives. And then uh, if you use geometric algebra instead, these are all unified to a single equation, uh, where you only have a single field and a single derivative operation. So there you can probably see that it's much more natural than having these separate. Um, another thing it unifies is uh, other different concepts such as uh, vectors and complex numbers and quaternions and matrices. So uh, if you don't know about some of these, that's fine. But uh, basically, uh, usually we treat this as completely separate. And uh, with geometric algebra, these are actually part of uh, one kind of concept. Um, yeah, so another point is uh, if you do computer graphics, for example, then you need to implement all these different functions. For example, we want to construct a plane from points or a plane from an equation. And uh, you would need to implement all of this kind of by just looking up equations and then using those. And also you have lots of different objects here. You have for points, you would probably use vectors. You would also use vectors for directions. but. Uh, for some operations, you would probably need matrices or quaternions, for example, for rotating things. And then uh, if you go more complicated, you can even use dual quaternions. And yeah, so you just keep adding different kinds of objects and uh, you need to convert between all of these. So that doesn't feel so great, I guess. Uh, if you use geometric algebra instead, you only have one kind of object and uh, you can construct these different geometric objects using those. Then, for example, here, plane from points, you pass it three points, and then uh, you use this operation, which I won't name yet, to construct this plane. And uh, yeah, it all looks very similar and very simple. And you don't need to make up new things. You, you don't need to make up matrices or quaternions there. These are already kind of contained in this single object that we're using. Um, then I have another example here of rigid body dynamics. I'm going to show that really quickly can't see that. Um, so you can see there's a pendulum in two dimensions and uh, he just changes the variable to three dimensions and then it just works. All the equations stay the same. And yeah, you can even change it to four dimensions or any dimensions. So these equations work in any number of dimensions. So that's one uh, advantage you get if you use this kind of geometric algebra. Uh, and yeah, here's in the bottom right, there's another picture with the performance. So the usual way you do computer graphics is with four by four matrices. And if you use this, uh, these PGA motors instead, in geometric algebra, you use, they, they require less multiplications and additions and so on. So not only is it more elegant, but it's also more efficient and you don't need to do any conversions. Okay. Um, so that's why you would, uh, you might want to use geometric algebra and there are not more reasons than that. Uh, so here's also a brief history of GA. Um, I'm not a history expert, but this is just like a very broad overview. So it was de developed already in the 19th century, but uh, it got kind of forgotten in favor of what we use now, which is uh, vectors, matrices, and tensors. Uh, so then uh, in the around the 60s, it got picked up again by Hessenus, and he found that uh, it makes quantum mechanics very natural. Like usually quantum mechanics is taught as if everything is very abstract, but here you found a very concrete geometric meaning for, for example, the gamma matrices, if you're familiar with that. Um, yeah, so this kind of started the research on geometric algebra and all the interest. And yeah, since, uh, since then there have been lots of new uses for geometric algebra found, and even now there are a lot of uh, there's still a lot of open research and people are still working on this, especially in the last couple of years. Again, um, yeah, so what are we going to learn in this presentation? Um, so 
first of all, these are the prerequisites, so you need to know very basic vector algebra. Um, just very simple stuff like what vectors are and maybe the dot and cross product, nothing too fancy. Uh, it's also good if you know complex numbers because we'll make use of Euler's formula. Uh, hopefully, if you don't know that, it will still make sense. Um, and so the goal is to introduce vanilla geometric algebra, which is the most basic form, but hopefully it will help you understand all the more complicated forms as well. And I'll touch on those in the end also. So yeah, we'll learn about vectors and then uh, how to do rotations in two dimensions and in three dimensions. And yeah, this will generalize to any dimensions also. And yeah, another goal is to demystify complex numbers and quaternions, which we usually just kind of make up and then they're useful, but they're kind of abstract, but here they really get a real geometric meaning. And another thing I'll show you is duality, which I won't talk about yet. Okay, so yeah, the outline is uh, first I'll do a short recap of vector algebra, then I'll do geometric algebra basics, um, then I'll show you 2D geometric algebra, how to do rotations and so on, and then the same thing in 3D. And yeah, after that I have one application, which is how to interpolate rotations using this knowledge we have now. And finally, like uh, I'll also show you how to go beyond this vanilla geometric algebra into some of the more interesting and useful algebras. Okay, so let's start with the first section, which is a very short recap for vector algebra. So, um, yeah, usually you, write, you can write vectors like this. So you have basis vectors denoted by E. So we have E1 and E2 here, for example, in two dimensions. And then you have these coefficients for each basis vector, like here V1 and V2. And you can visualize these as arrows from the origin. And uh, yeah, this is how it would look like for this kind of vector that goes four in this direction and two in this direction. And you can split these up into these parts. So you have this 4E1 here and 2E2. And then we have one of our products is the dot product. Um, yeah, this is how you compute it. And uh, it tells you something about the similarity between two vectors and the angle between them. If they are parallel, then the dot product is bigger than if, uh, if they are not parallel. And if they are orthogonal, then the dot product is zero. Um, another product we have, oh yeah, I need to mention this. So yeah, this is what you get for the basis vectors. If you have, if you do the dot product with two of the same basis vectors, you will get one. If you do them with two different basis vectors, then you will get zero. And this is what the symbol stands for. So if the i and j are the same, then this is one, and otherwise it's zero. Um, yeah, then the cross product. Well, what's the cross product of two two-dimensional vectors? It doesn't uh, really work in two dimensions. Um, so our cross product is usually kind of specific to three dimensions. Um, yeah, so how does it work in three dimensions? There's this formula that probably most of us have memorized. And yeah, so what does it give you? It actually produces uh, a third vector that is sort of orthogonal to the two vectors that you put in. And also another interesting fact about it is if you flip these two vectors and do the same product, then all you do is uh, pick up a negative sign and produce the vector in the opposite direction. Uh, yeah, so that's it for the very basic recap, and we'll make use of some of this knowledge now. So uh, one thing we want to do is we want to find a general product for any kind of vector. Uh, so here we had two different products, but they didn't really behave like the ordinary product yet. So yeah, that's that's our goal. Um, yeah, so now the geometric algebra basics, where we kind of do this. So. Yeah, the goal is to find a single general product for vectors. Um, so here's an algebraic approach. Uh, we take one rule from the dot product, which was that if we have two of the same basis vectors, they, out, they are, the dot product is one and otherwise it's zero. So we pick up this rule for our product. And then we take the second rule from the cross product, which is that uh, if you swap two basis vectors, then you pick up a minus sign, like here, EIJ, EI, EJ is minus EJ times EI. So those are all the rules you really need for this kind of basic product. And 
yeah, let's try to do an example here and see maybe where this leads us. So let's multiply two two-dimensional vectors. Um, yeah, those vectors a and b can look like this. And now all we need to do is uh, we write this down, a times b, and then um, we will just multiply this like any anyone even in high school or earlier could do. Just multiply it part by part and apply the rules we have above. So here's what we get. So we write this down and then um, yeah, multiply this out exactly as it is. And then we can start applying the rules from above. So we have we applied the first rule to e1, e1. That results in 1. Uh, so we're left with a1, b1. And then we again apply the first rule to this last part to e2, e2. That results in 1. And then we're left with a2, b2. And then uh, yeah, we're left with this part in the result. Then we also have these other two parts. So the first one we can't really simplify it, but to this second part, e2, e1, we will apply the second rule. And all it does is swap these two basis vectors and we'll pick up a minus sign. So uh, this is what we're left with. Uh, we have this part from from here, and then we have this other part that uh, contains this e1 and e2 that we can't simplify further. Um, so. One thing we can see is this first part is pretty much just the dot product. And then we also have the second part. Uh, it looks kind of like part of the three-dimensional cross product formula, but uh, it works in any dimension. We didn't make any assumptions about dimensions here. Um, and this is usually called the wedge product. So yeah, if we multiply two vectors, then we can separate it into a part with a dot product and a wedge product. Although this separation is not really necessary. Uh, all we did was apply our rules here. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, and uh, so this part contains actually two vectors. And because it's it contains two vectors, we call this a bivector. The bi stands for two. And yeah, this decomposition into dot and wedge product only works for vectors. So it doesn't work in general. Um, okay, so what is actually the geometric interpretation of this? So we have our result here of a times b, and uh, yeah, the dot product part is has the same interpretation as before. There's some kind of similarity measure, for example. So nothing changed here. But uh, what is this other part, this wedge product part? Um, this is actually like the oriented area spanned by these vectors a and b. So if you have a and b here, then uh, this a wedge b part is represents this oriented area here. And oriented here means that it matters which order we use. So if we did it in the other order, then it would be oriented in the other way and would have a minus sign. Um, yeah. Another thing people often do is uh, in this result here we had we wrote e1 and e2, but people often abbreviate this as e1 2. Uh, just because it's more convenient, so I'll continue doing that from here on out. Um, yeah, so a summary of geometric algebra basics. These really, uh, if, if you know these rules, you can really do almost all of geometric algebra already. Um, so yeah, you have this one rule where, uh, which is like the dot product that two same basis vectors multiply to one and two different ones multiply to zero. Uh, yeah, and then you have this other rule where uh, two. Oh, I said that wrong. Okay, so if you have two of the same basis vectors, they they are one, and uh, here here it should say a dot. Um, so two different ones would dot to zero, but uh, with this or with this product, we can't really simplify it anymore. It wouldn't be zero. So if they are different, then all we can do is swap them and we pick up a minus sign. So these are the true rules you need for the product. Um, yeah, if you multiply two vectors with this product, you get one part that is like the dot product and another part that is the wedge product of those two vectors. And uh, yeah, another thing was writing this shorthand notation if you have e1 and e2, then you can write that as e1, 2 instead. And same for any number of basis vectors, like e1, 
E3, E2 would uh, have shorthand notation E1, 2, 1, 3, 2. And here's some more examples where we apply this rule. So yeah, if we have E2, 1, you can apply the second rule to get minus E1, 2. If we have E3, 2, 1, you can apply the second rule twice. So all you do is swap these numbers here once and pick up a minus sign. Then you do it again. Uh, and then you do it again. So yeah, if we do this three times, we pick up. All we do is pick up a minus sign, but then the order is different. And here's another example: uh, e1 to 1. So we can apply the second rule once. Then we're left with minus e1 1 2, and then we can apply the first rule. And e1 e1 just results in 1. So all we're left with is minus e2. Okay. So now we'll try to actually do something useful with this. So I'll start by introducing two-dimensional vanilla geometric algebra. So first of all, what kind of elements do we have in the algebra? So this is what we have in with ordinary vectors already, what you probably already know. So you have scalars and you have vectors or basis vectors and everything else is made out of these. But now in geometric algebra, we also have this new kind of element, which is composed of two vectors, just those two basis vectors multiplied and yeah, this is this E12 and it represents this plane spanned by those two basis vectors. And that's all we really have in two dimensions. So yeah, as I said, ordinarily you only have these first two and we've been completely ignoring these other, this other part that is already there naturally. Um, yeah, in general, what you can do, you can even add these different parts. So ordinarily, you also don't really add scalars and vectors, for example, but in geometric algebra, you're free to do so, and that's actually very useful. And we'll see why in, a, in just a few minutes. So a general two-dimensional multivector would look like this. You have the scalar part, then you have the vector part with our two different vectors, and then you also have the spy vector part with its own coefficient. Um, so one thing we want to solve with this is uh, yeah, how can we rotate vectors? Um, you might usually do it with matrices, for example, two by two matrices. Uh, I'll show you another way with geometric algebra now that reveals kind of why geometric algebra is so useful. So my claim is that if you multiply a vector by the spaces by vector E12, then it will rotate the vector by 90 degrees. So yeah, I'll just... Uh, show you that this actually works. So we, if we start with a vector e1 and we multiply that with the spaces by vector e1, 2, then uh, yeah, we get e2. And indeed, that's a 90 degree rotation, like I claimed. And you can keep doing this. If you multiply it again, you get minus e1, then minus e2, and then you're back to e1. So it does seem to multiply by 90 degrees. OK, uh, but uh, how do we get rotations for any kind of angle now, not just multiples of 90 degrees? So uh, one thing you can notice here is that if you try to square the spaces by vector, so you do E12 times E12, you get this, and then you apply the second rule, which is that you can swap two of these digits, then you're left with minus E1122. Then you can apply the first rule, which will contract these. E11 is 1 and E22 is 1. So all you're left with is minus 1. So if you know complex numbers or imaginary units, then you are probably familiar with this. And this uh, gives kind of a hint on the origin of those. Uh, so this E12 behaves like an imaginary unit. And we didn't have to introduce any new magic for this, really. It's just there naturally. So yeah, if you compare it with the imaginary unit, uh, it also squares to minus 1. And here, uh, something really important is this Euler's formula, where which you can use to rotate complex numbers by an arbitrary angle. So we'll just, uh, th this formula works for any i that squares to minus one. So we can also make use of this formula in geometric algebra. Uh, and I won't derive it uh, for now. So yeah, if we use the same kind of formula for this e12, then uh, this is how it looks. So you have e to the phi and then e12 and that will just give you this combination here this cosine of phi plus sine of phi times e12 so yeah this can be used to rotate vectors by an arbitrary angle so 
here's an example. So these, uh, if we have a vector a and then we want to rotate it by an angle phi, then we construct this, what we call a rotor, which is exactly like with complex numbers. And if you multiply this vector by this rotor, then um, you will get a, the rotated vector. And yeah, I wrote down the formula for that here. You could multiply it out, but it will give you the rotated vector. Um, if you take a further look at this rotor, you can also see that it has a scalar part and it has a bivector part. So we're adding different um, grades, as it, it's called, uh, different kinds of objects, and that actually seems very useful here. Okay, um, so another cool thing we can do is uh, if we want to compose rotations, so the one rotation and then another rotation, we all we need to do is um, we construct two of these rotors, one rotates by phi and another rotates by theta, and to compose these, um, yeah, this, we want this to find this R3 and all we need to do is multiply these two rotors. So, uh, yeah, that's something you can do very easily and uh, you end up just adding these angles actually in the exponential. So yeah, rotor composition is very simple. Um, yeah, and then instead of uh, first multiplying a by r1 and a by r2, you can just multiply a by this uh, combined rotor instead to get c. Um, another thing we want to do is, uh, so we have this rotor given and we have, uh, for example, b given, but not a, then we would like to actually invert this rotor and go the opposite direction. So we would like to apply this inverted rotor to B and then uh, then we would like to get back A. So the question is how can we find an inverse for this rotor? And yeah, this is another cool feature of GA. So you can actually divide by vectors. It's not something you could do with uh, with the usual way you use vectors and so on. But here the, the product is actually invertible. So I'll give one example here for vectors. Um, so we have some vector here, 41. And uh, so how, well, how do we want our inverse to actually look like? So um, yeah, the property of inverses is that if you multiply with them, then you get just the identity or one. So how do we, how do we get this such a part uh, it's very simple for vectors. You can uh, just take the vector and then divide by the vector squared. And the reason this works is that here this vector will square to a scalar. So here the numerator we have just 41, which is a, and the denominator we have a squared. So you get 41 times 41. And this e1, e1 results in 1 because of the first rule of j. And then we are left with 4 e1 divided by 16, and we are left with e1 divided by 4. Um, yeah, so if we, we would indeed get, uh, if we multiplied a and a inverse here, we would indeed get 1. Uh, yeah, and now you can do stuff like divide other vectors by this inverse vector, by, by this vector a here, like for example here, b divided by a, and uh, yeah, this A inverse, we just computed it here before, so we can just multiply with it, and this is what we're left with, whatever this means. Um, so back to our original problem, I'll just go back for a second so you remember. Uh, we wanted to invert this rotor here, so we can go back from B to A, and yeah, now we can just invert this, the rotor. Um, so yeah, this is how a rotor looks like. We knew that it has some scalar part and some bivector part. And yeah, this is the property we want for the inverse, just like for any inverse. And the way you get the inverse for rotors, I won't derive it now, but it turns out uh, you apply this operation here. It's called the reverse operation. And all you need to do here is flip all the order of all these basis vectors appearing in here. So. Here we start with u plus v times e12. If you apply this inverse, uh, this reverse operation, you get a u plus v times e21. So all this that was flipping this here, and then 
your you can apply the second rule to swap e21 to e12 and pick up a minus sign and yeah this is the inverse rotor that we were looking for so yeah and you can also verify here if you multiply an arbitrary rotor with its reverse then uh, yeah you get u squared plus v squared which is the coefficients of it and uh, now we need to remember where our rotor came from so it contains something with cosine of an angle and sine of an angle and if you add the squares of those you get one so this is why this results in one and why this is actually the inverse like we wanted um, yeah so now we can actually use it uh, if we have a, a rotor R and we want to inverse invert it, yeah, then we just apply the reverse and we can multiply with it. Okay, so that concludes the, the section about the two-dimensional vanilla GA. Um, so next we'll just go one dimension up to three dimensions. Uh, let's first of all look at which elements we have again. So again, like like an ordinary vector algebra, we have scalars and we have vectors. So this is all you usually have. But then we also have more objects. So you can multiply E1 with E2, you can multiply E1 with E3, and you can multiply E2 with E3. So you have three of these bivectors and they still represent oriented areas. So in three dimensions you have three different kinds of planes. And uh, below there's one drawn here, E12 plane. But there are also there's also E23 and E13 plane. And now something we didn't have in two dimensions, now we also have this volume element, which you get when you multiply all the three vectors together. And uh, this is called a tri-vector because yeah, it's three vectors. And yeah, again we have been ignoring these pi vectors and tri vectors all the time, even though they are kind of there naturally and are useful. Okay, now how can we rotate vectors in three dimensions? It is really almost the same. There is uh, we still rotate uh, using this Euler's formula and uh, a pi vector in the plane we want to rotate in. For example, if you want to rotate in the e one two plane, then you exponentiate the e12 by vector with an angle and then you can multiply vectors with that. There's one important difference though. Um, so far in two dimensions all the vectors lie in the plane of rotation uh, because there is only one plane in two dimensions so it always lies there. Uh, and so in two dimensions the formula was a bit simpler so all we had to do was multiply our vectors or whatever we wanted to rotate with this rotor. But now in three dimensions we have, you can also have the case that the vectors don't lie in the plane of rotation. So then we need a slightly more complicated formula, which I won't motivate for now. But uh, yeah, this is what you would need to do. You would need to do this sandwich product. Um, so if you have a rotor A, then you need to do a sandwich product. And that's how you get the rotated vector. Also, since uh, we're like multiplying on the left and right hand side, we only need to a rotor only needs to contain half of the angle, so that's also why you get uh, e to the phi half here instead. Um, yeah, then how can we compose these? So this time we can do much more interesting things than in two dimensions. We don't just add these angles, but we can even uh, compose rotors that rotate in different planes. And um, yeah, so on the left side you have rotor that rotates by phi in the e23 plane and on the right hand side you have rotor r2 that rotates by theta half in the e12 plane and uh, yeah another important thing to mention is that the order matters here if you rotate with r1 first and then by r with r2 it's not the same as rotating in the in the opposite order so that's also reflected by the algebra so r2 times r1 is not r1 times r2 and I have an example here in a second. So yeah, if we have a vector a and we want to rotate it first with r2 in in this e12 plane, then uh, we might get something like this. b might look like this. And then we rotate it in this other plane, e23. We, multi we apply this rotor again. And then we get some third vector called c. 
And yeah, this is what you would get. Now, um, and yeah, you can compose these like I mentioned. So you would get uh, the rotor that's applied first needs to be on the right hand side. So here you would get R3 as R1 times R2 and you would get the same result just applying R3 to this vector. Uh, now if we do it in the opposite order, you can see that uh, if we apply R1 first, which rotates in the E2-3 plane, uh, nothing changes for A because uh, yeah, if you rotate it in that plane, then the vector just stays the same. Uh, yeah, and if we then rotate it in the other plane, in the E1-2 plane, then then it would actually do something. But yeah, the result is not the same as if you change as if you use the different order. And again, you can, of course, compose these by multiplying. Okay, um, another thing we would like to look at is uh, what parts does this 3D rotor actually have? So before, in two dimensions, we saw that it kind of looked like a complex number, and it had a scalar and a bivector part. So what parts does it have in three dimensions? So if we take a rotor that rotates in E2-3 plane, we still have scalar plus this E2-3 bivector, and if we have uh, if we have a rotor that rotates in the E1-2 plane, then we still have scalar plus uh, some E1-2 part. Uh, now in general, we could, for example, multiply this R1 and R2, and uh, yeah, then this is how it would look like, and if we multiply this out, we can see we have we would have one scalar part from cosine times cosine, we have, would have one E2-3 part from sine times cosine, we would have one E1-2 part from um, cosine times sine, and then we have an E1-3 part from, uh, well, sine times sine, because E2-3 times E1-2 results in something proportional to E1-3, because the two cancels out with the first rule. So yeah, we actually have a scalar plus three different bivector parts. Um, now we can try squaring these different bivectors again and we would find out that they indeed square to minus one again. So we have three different elements that square to minus one. Um, if you're familiar with quaternions, this is actually exactly what they are. So with quaternions we kind of made up these three different imaginary units that square to minus one, but uh, what they actually represent are these three different planes you can rotate in, so that's where they come from. Um, yeah. Okay. Another cool topic in geometric algebra is duality. So what is duality? It's uh, You can see that we have these different elements here in our three geometric algebra. We have the scalars, the vectors, bivectors, and tr one trivector. And there's a one-to-one -one mapping here. So for each scalar, we have uh, one trivector, and for each vector, we have one bivector. There are three of each, so can create some kind of mapping between them. And here's an example of how you could do this mapping. So yeah, scalars map to trivectors, and trivectors map to scalars. Uh, maybe E1 maps to E2, 3, E2 could map to E1, 3, and also in the opposite order, and so on. Um, so there are many different ways of doing this kind of mapping, and I'll show you one of the most popular ways of doing this. Uh, so yeah, the most popular way is taking this trivector, which is also called pseudoscalar, because uh, yeah, there, there's always one pseudoscalar, exactly as many as there are scalars. Uh, so yeah, if you multiply with this, then you actually do exactly uh, this kind of dual mapping. So I'll give you an example here. Um, so this star here, I I'm writing it like this to it should stand for the dual of whatever is inside here. So yeah, the dual of e uh, of a times e12 for example, uh, we could use this operation here multiplying by the pseudoscalar. Now uh, yeah, if we multiply this out, then all we're left with is minus a times e3, and yeah, this adds up with what we wanted above here. Like if we looked at e12, then there's a mapping between e3 and e12, and yeah. If you apply the dual operation twice, uh, one thing you need to keep in mind is that you're not actually guaranteed to end up with the same object again. For example, if we take the result here, we had in the first line minus e minus a times e three and take the dual, and you apply. Um, 
Okay, I think I do see it. Can you hear me again? Yeah, now it's better. Okay, yeah, I'll continue. Okay, so uh, yeah, if you um, if you apply the dual operation twice, you're not guaranteed to end up with what you started with. So in general, you need to apply it four times, but uh, this is something that depends also on which kind of tool operation you choose. Um, now, what this is, is this useful for? So, uh, uh, so if we have two vectors A and B, and we calculate the swatch product between them, then the swatch product gives us the oriented area spent by them. And now what we want to do is uh, to this oriented area, which is a bivector, we want to apply this duality operation. And if I go back, so if we apply duality operation to a bivector, we get back a vector. You can see here. So if we do this here, then what we get is actually, this is actually the cross product in three dimensions. So uh, yeah, this is what the cross product actually is. It gives you the vectors that are orthogonal to to those two input vectors. And th the reason that's specific to three dimensions is that only in three dimensions there's one vector for each for each plane. Uh, so yeah, I hope that kind of explains why uh, why the cross product only works in three dimensions and how we can generalize this. Um, yeah, so for the next part, I have one application that might be useful for you and that's uh, interpolating rotations. So, um, let's see, this load, okay, I guess this doesn't load, anyway, uh, so we have, if we have uh, two different rotations, um, and we want to interpolate between them, we can't just linearly interpolate, otherwise, uh, it doesn't look, uh, it doesn't look right. So one thing you want to do here is, for example, if you have one rotation on the top of the sphere, and another rotation on the towards the bottom of the sphere, then you want to interpolate them so the rotation between them lies on this kind of sphere. And this is called a spheric, spherical interpolation or also short for a slurp or a slurp. Um, so how can you actually do this with geometric algebra? Um, so you have these two rotors. The one where you start at is R1, for example, and then you have another one where you, that's your target, R2. And uh, yeah, if you want to interpolate them, then you have this R of t, with t between 0 and 1. And our starting point at 0 is R1, and our end point at 1 is R2. Um, so if the angles are given, this is pretty simple actually. Uh, so our interpolated rotor would be um, e to the, and then the linear interpolation between these two angles. Uh, so that would be relatively simple, but uh, yeah, what if we only have these rotors given, for example? Um, what we can do then is take the logarithm of these rotors. So this logarithm will invert the Sidic exponential function and give us the argument in there. So if we take the logarithm of R1, for example, we get uh, phi1 times e12, and uh, similarly for R2. And uh, yeah, so once we have those, we can just do what we did when the angles are already given, which is just linearly interpolate between these these two bivectors and then exponentiate again. So yeah, let's do that. Uh, and this is what we get then. So if we have R1 and R2, the way we can do the spherical interpolation for the rotation is uh, yeah, the, do the, use the exponential function with the um, with uh, the logarithm of these two rotors linearly interpolated. Um, yeah, and uh, not only does this work in, well, three dimensions, but this works really in any dimension, even in 10 dimensions or, yeah, whatever you want. There's nothing dimension specific here. The only problem is that you need to know how to calculate this exponential function and this logarithm. So, you know, we already knew how to calculate the exponential function for some simple elements, which square to minus one, but uh, in general, it's a bit more tricky. Yes, and also the logarithm is also more tricky. Uh, so uh, this year or, or last year, there was this new paper called Graded Symmetry Groups, Plain and Simple, which showed how to how you can calculate the exponential function and logarithm in any dimension for any kind of GA element. So 
yeah, if you're interested in that, you can take a look at that. And they also have a lot of other great insights into geometry problems and geometric algebra in general. So I left some links here if you want to take a look at that. Um, yeah, so far um, we only looked at vanilla geometric algebra. Uh, and yeah, now I'll show you how to go beyond that or what vanilla even really means. Um, yeah, so far we only kind of uh, made sense of existing concepts like quaternions and complex numbers. Um, but uh, the actual real power of geometric algebra comes from making different kinds of algebras, it's meaning um, introducing more basis vectors and also changing what the basis vectors square to. So, so far all of our basis vectors square to plus one, but uh, another other common choices are also making them square to minus one or, or zero. And the reason this is useful is that, um, yeah, so, so this is what we've seen so far, the bivectors square to minus one, and then you have this, uh, this represents a rotation, which we kind of got with Euler's formula. But if the, the spy vector now squares to something else, for example, plus one, um, then you don't get cosine and sine anymore, but you get, uh, for example, a hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine here. And this is useful for what's called boosts, which you might be familiar with if you did special relativity. And another really useful one is uh, if the spy vector squares to zero, then you can actually do translations with uh, with these spy vectors. Um, so you might be wondering why this is useful because we could already, for example, add vectors together before and do translations like that. But uh, if you have by vectors in your algebra that do rotation and you have by vectors that do translation, then you can actually compose this in one unified way instead of needing to handle rotations and translations separately. So yeah, this is why these are actually really useful. And yeah, I'll show you some more geometric algebras now that are pretty commonly used in, within GA and what their advantages are and what kind of stuff you can do with them. Um, so one really popular one in physics is the space-time algebra. Here you have uh, one basis vector for the time dimension and that squares to plus one and then you have one for each space dimension x, y, and z that squares to minus one. Um, yeah, the applications for this are in special relativity and uh, like I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, this is useful because uh, you get bivectors vectors that square to plus one to do boosts, um, which is uh, if you have uh, an observer moving relative to another observer with some velocity, which is what you're interested in in special relativity. And then you also still have these other bivectors vectors that do ordinary spatial rotation. Um, they're also useful in quantum mechanics, and if you're familiar with it, uh, in quantum mechanics we have these four gamma matrices, and usually they're thought to be some abstract thing, but here they're actually very concretely the basis vectors of space-time, so that gives us a lot of geometric insight. And yeah, it's also used in electromagnetism, uh, like in the beginning when I showed how it unifies, there this algebra is also used. Um, yeah, this is what I just mentioned already. You have three by vectors doing rotations and three by vectors doing boosts. Uh, another cool algebra is uh, if you have dual numbers, so this is very simple, you just have one basis vector for example that squares to zero, and you can do automatic differentiation with them for example, so if some function f of x is x squared, um, and then you as input you have a scalar plus uh, this dual number part, so f of x plus e zero, and then you evaluate this, you get uh, x plus e zero squared, and yeah, you just evaluate this like before, you get x squared plus, and then you have 2x times e zero, and e zero squared is zero, like we defined. And then, you're, so you're left with x squared plus 2x e zero. So the e zero part in the result is actually what the derivative of f of x is. So this is a very simple way to do automatic differentiation. So in this example, um, we only had one variable and first order derivatives, but this also generalizes to uh, any order of derivative and also multiple variables. And I left a link here with an article where I try to explain how to do that. Um, another popular algebra 
that's really become popular in the last few years is uh, PGA. Originally, the P stood for projective, but more recently, it got kind of renamed to plane-based geometric algebra because that fits better. Uh, yes, so here you have one basis vector squaring to a zero and then three basis vectors. Well, this is in three dimensions of space. Let's square to plus one. So you have this one extra basis vector that squares to zero, basically, if you're in 3D. Um, yeah, the applications are uh, Euclidean geometry. Uh, so you can do anything that is kind of uh, flat with this. So in three dimensions, you have, for example, you have lines, you have planes, and then you can do very simple things like intersecting a line with a plane and then getting the point where they intersect and things like this. And yeah, this is very useful in rigid body dynamics also, uh, like the example I showed in the beginning that was using PGA and yeah, also for computer graphics because you deal with these kind of geometric objects there a lot. Now, um, yeah, another really cool property is that it unifies translations and rotations. And so you can have one rot rotor that does both. And uh, you can actually use the idea from the previous section for interpolating rotations on this too. So you have something that interpolates between two things that store both translation and rotation and have it look smooth. Um, yeah. And yeah, you have these two kinds of rotors here. So one kind doing rotations and the other kind doing translations and you can compose them as you wish. Uh, another algebra that's kind of common is conformal geometric algebra. So this one can ha has two extra basis vectors, one squaring to minus one and plus one. And this can represent uh, flat objects like PGA, but it can also represent round objects. So for example, spheres or circles can be directly represented as elements. And uh, the transformations here are the conformal transformations, uh, the, the, which is the angle preserving transformations. So yeah, if you're interested in conformal transformations, then conformal geometric algebra is probably what you want to take a look at. Um, yeah, then I have some a list of some more resources if you want to uh, learn some more about GA with this basic knowledge now. So if, uh, here's some popular choices, for example, Geometric Algebra for Physicists uh, has a lot of uh, different topics in physics uh, done with Geometric Algebra and then yeah, some more that you can read here on your own. Um, yeah, online I, there's this uh, really cool website called The Coffee Shop. I left a link here and this has a lot of um, demos of Geometric Algebra with code also side by side in JavaScript and yeah, this has a lot of different examples. And uh, yeah, if you're a programmer or yeah, want to do some experiments, then there are lots of different libraries already available. And I listed some of those here. The most complete one, I would say, in terms of operations is probably the JavaScript one, Gandra.js. But uh, if you're doing Python, then there are also some nice libraries here. And yeah, that's it. Uh, yeah, do you have any questions? Well, also. Geometric algebra for physicists. Mm -hmm. So, how, I wonder how is it uh, used in physics? Uh, so, to, usually in physics, when you're taught physics in school or in university, for example, um, you use like uh, vectors or quaternions or tensors. Like in, in each different field, you use different kinds of tools. but. With geometric algebra, all you need is geometric algebra, pretty much. So this book introduces different fields in physics with geometric algebra from uh, pretty basics. Also, I w although I would say that it's still a bit necessary to already know some something about physics. Um, so it goes actually pretty far. It even goes as far as quantum mechanics and general relativity. Nice. Good thing that we have physicists here. <laughs> Two physicists. Johnny, any any comments? <laughs> uh, so what's what's the geometric part of the algebra? What's the geometric product? Uh, the geometric product is just this. Well, why is it geometric? 
Uh, it's geometric. No, 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 part, like P, A, or T. The geometric part? Can you repeat yeah, it? Yeah, like why is it called geometric, I guess? Yeah, um, yeah. I guess uh, because geometric algebra in general uh, has a lot to do with geometry. So if with every equation, you can kind of associate a geometry and visualize it. Uh, I didn't show it too much here yet, but it becomes really obvious when you go to things like PGA later. And uh, yeah, the geometric product is just this, the product of geometric algebra that uh, is kind of naturally there. So yeah. I guess it's called geometric product because it's called geometric algebra. I don't know who came up with the name. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I guess um, like what I'm interested in is uh, is this how is this connected to like a Lie algebra? Mm -hmm. So I'm not an expert in Lie algebra or groups, but uh, I can go back a few pages. So with this uh, spherical loop, for example, uh, these uh, rotors here are part of the Lie group of rotations or I think it's called uh, the pin group actually, and uh, no, the pin group is in PJ. This is the just uh, SO3, I think. Anyway, I'm not an expert in that. And uh, if you take the logarithm of these, then you get the Lie algebra elements. So it's very closely connected to that. So here with this interpolation, for example, you're interpolating in the Lie algebra, and then you get something meaningful uh, compared to if you interpolate it in the directly in the Lie group space, interpolating these rotors directly, you wouldn't get something really useful. So I guess that's one part where it kind of shows up, but yeah, I'm not an expert on that. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's what I'm trying to understand, which is like, there's already like algebras, right? That are defined by like generators of your Lie group or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so like, how did, I was trying to understand how geometric algebra fits into these because you mentioned like things like boosts and all this kind of stuff. Like, yeah. So, uh, so as far as I understand, like, like again, I'm not an expert and I might be using misusing terminology, but these bi vectors uh, are actually the generators. So yeah, if you exponentiate them, so the bi, bi vectors live in the Lie algebra or whatever, and if you exponentiate them, mm -hmm. then you get the Lie group elements. So, uh, so what are like the commutation relations for this algebra? I guess like what defines it? Uh, I can't answer that. Sorry, I don't know enough about that. Okay, no worries. But uh, yeah, people have definitely done this work, and it's a really big topic. There's also a paper called yeah. The, the conformal thing is is super cool. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like conformal stuff goes like really deep. <laughs> yeah, just I... like, yeah. Maybe I can do another talk on one of these, but there's some really cool stuff you can do here. Um, oh yeah, maybe also to mention that, so this PGA uh, does Euclidean transformations and I think it had something to do with the pin group, like I already said. Yeah, it's pretty neat. So Robin, can you can you just uh, yet again explain how you go from like uh, yeah I mean like an n sphere like a x squared plus y squared plus z squared etc. Mm -hmm. um, equals some radius squared uh, uh, to the, to the conformal or like to being able to map these spheres in in these base vectors. Yeah, that's a great question. I didn't really touch on this at all here, so that would require another <laughs> session, I guess. But uh, the way this is done is basically you have a function that uh, takes in coordinates and then uh, spits out some kind of five-dimensional vector, for example, that represents those coordinates. And then what you can do is you can take a couple of different points and join them together, and that gives you an element that represents the sphere. Um, so that's another thing I didn't touch on at all here. So there are operations for joining different elements. So if you have two points and join them, for example, in PGA, you get a line. And there's another operation for doing the opposite, which is intersection. If you intersect two lines, then you get a point, for example. So yeah, that that's how you could, for example, make a sphere in CGA. You take a bunch of points and join them, and then you get the sphere where all those points lie on. But yeah, I, I didn't show this at all here. Just wanted to mention that those algebras exist. Cool. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, yeah, any more questions? Otherwise, I guess we're done.
Good stuff.